Hello, protocols, packets, and programs. Role-playing games involve small groups of people making things up. Lists and tables, communication skills, and random events. It's like AppSec, but with better tabletop exercises. This Saturday is June 25th. Uh, this Saturday is June 25th, and it's also Free RPG Day. So if you know VI, but not the Eye of Vecna, check it out. Which means we take a look at the history of browser security and bug bounties as Microsoft turns IE11 down to zero. In the news segment, Hertzbleed opens hailing frequencies. Orca runs Synlapse around Azure. More MFA for package managers. The life and death and life and death again of a Savari Vuln and more. Check for traps and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. Your organization is building and updating business-critical web applications faster than ever. And with so much pressure to move fast, you may find yourself making trade-offs between innovation and security. Now you can build fast without sacrificing security with Invicti, the application security platform that helps your dev, sec, and ops teams work together to secure every website, web app, and API. With unparalleled accuracy, coverage, and automation, Invicti scales like no other AppSec solution. Discover why many of the world's largest organizations innovate securely with Invicti. Visit securityweekly.com slash Invicti. This is episode 201, recorded June 21st, 2022. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and once again, I'm here with Mr. John Kinsella. John, it's good to see you and have you back feeling hopefully a lot better now. Once again, it feels like it's been about five years, man. Um, it's good to be back. Uh, survived RSA. Didn't get COVID. I got something else, but um, still recovering. You can probably hear my voice, but good to be here. It's good to be here. Yeah, we have you. Um, have you for starting off our our new section of or what was the new era of two hundreds and beyond? We had Keith last week, which hopefully you uh, were able to to hear us uh, lament your absence as well as riff a little bit, but um. We'll have Heath back, but we want to make sure that we have you around for a good, at least another 200, so we can get to the 404 uh, joke, at least, that we can um, build up for these for these episodes. <laughs> but as we build those up, uh, if anyone out there has a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows, submit your suggestions by visiting securityweekly.com slash guests and completing the form. We review suggestions monthly, and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. So, John, this is a... This is a special conversation with Kinsella segment, meaning that we're going to do a deep dive on a topic. And um, I thought since Internet Explorer 11 is officially retired, even Microsoft says so, um, you know, they've gone to 11, but you know, for all you Spinal Tap fans out there, uh, but this is the end of an era from 1995 all the way to uh, IE 11 was originally released in October 2013. So there's a couple avenues I thought we could take with this because one is just talking about the time it takes to try and get to to retire program to programs to move to migrate onto better architectures. But there's also an aspect that IE 11 was pretty critical or pretty, uh, it, it was a key moment within the history of bug bounties as well. Um, but first, uh, before we uh, before we get into some of the more interesting aspects, I'm not sure if uh, you want to say a few words over the demise <laughs> of Internet Explorer 11. <laughs> Man, I'm still sort of, I mean, okay, so let's see. Uh, I haven't been a, even a, I, I, I've, I've got some Windows systems around, but I'm, I mean, I'm barely a passive Windows user for the last, oh, mm -hmm. what, four or five years i haven't really used them much so i think really for me the last version of ie i probably used was probably 10 with any seriousness i knew 11 came out um i knew edges out but it's still the reason i'm sort of saying this it's it's a, at least to me and i think for a lot of windows users who are actually real windows users it's a bit of a shock that like it's it's over right um uh i i think that's that's probably my first thought. I mean, you know, it's it's we still still see IE six around every now and then. So you know, I'd love to say good riddance, but I think we know this is probably going to be another. What do you think? Five years before it goes away, <laughs> not ten. Um, so, 
it's the, I don't think it's the end. I think it's the beginning of the end. <clears throat> the beginning of the end. Well, it's there's a couple of thoughts on there. One is, you know, you have to admit kudos for keeping a program going, an application going for 25 plus years that was we we'll definitely joke a bit, uh, but you know that mostly worked, um, sort of like mostly dead. Um, but uh, so so there's one aspect there, of course. But you were saying too, like, is it how long is it going to take to disappear? If I'm going to offer up one bit of optimism, Flash, I think, disappeared pretty quickly once Microsoft okay. said we're going to add the kill bit and we're actually going to make it difficult, if not very impossible, <laughs> if that's such a phrase, to reinstall. So I think that was a really mm -hmm. good move that they did to, to say that, you know, Flash, it was dead. You know, the writing was on the wall for a long time. It was we saw it was going to die, but then it really did. IE 11, who knows? Um, at least Edge now, the, the modern browser that the Microsoft is using, has an IE 11 mode. So that will probably be the, your, you know, that five-year window that you're kind of thinking of perhaps there, that, that Edge keeps it alive, but Edge in that mode, that's probably going to be a source of vulnerabilities for Edge for a while. But what's interesting too is Edge is really just you know Chrome inside the the V8 uh, you know the the engine that that's running it and the the Chrome itself the windows around the the browser and rendering engine is is really uh, is what Microsoft did so it's interesting to see this consolidation as well of browsers especially the history of when IE first came out to stomp down, if you will, extend and embrace uh, Firefox or Mozilla and uh, become a major browser itself. Um, yeah, and it, I'm, I'm actually not thinking of um, the IE mode in, in Edge when I mentioned that. Yeah. I, I am thinking it, it is unfortunately going to be all those systems which either aren't <laughs> getting updated or like, you know, the person who updated is no longer there or, you know, whatever sort of reasoning. Um, I, I find it's useful for both uh, security testing as well as QA testing, the um, the capabilities of modern browsers just to act like another version without me having to go and, you know, install a proxy and do all sorts of funky things. So those are very handy. But um, yeah, I, I was thinking of the latter. And it's, it's it'll be interesting. I mean, it, it that should be, it sounds like that's gonna be a good simple thing, right? From with a web dev hat on, you go think, hey, that's one less browser that I have, to, one less rendering engine that I have to support, right? Since you know it's, it's all Chrome, right? Um, but I think we know in in reality that's uh, um, it'll it'll be better. And I know the browser capability wars have gotten better over the last few years, and what they used to be, and all the tricks you have to jump through to try and get you know something looking the same across three or four different platforms. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, right? Because we still have new. There's new platforms coming out. There's um, there's the Brave guys, which are probably mm -hmm. I, I can't remember who's who because I'm not doing this every day. Um, but there's the Brave guys. There's a few other browsers out there that are either you know trying to do like a Web three play or um, a uh, um, some sort of an, an ad sharing or excuse me a revenue sharing play. So there's a few different ones that are coming out there that are going to start getting traction as as people um, either don't want to use Bing or don't know how to change from Bing or you know whatever their reason <laughs> right. being. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see. And I think just to sort of to, to, to really take a step back for a second, the other thing which is on my radar right now is, um, there's more and more folks pushing in the other camp on, on Apple. Cause right now, um, on iOS devices are, you know, tvOS, iPadOS, I'm just going to right. put those all right. iOS. Um, you only have the choice of one, one, one rendering en engine underneath the hood. So even if you're using Firefox or I don't know. Is Edge out for I, for iOS? I might look for that during the break. But um, no matter what browser you're using, you still are using WebKit underneath the scenes, and, and people are um, a little nonplussed about that. So I think as at some point in the next year or two, Apple's going to you know sort of let go and allow people to change, and then you're going to have more sort of things coming up on that platform too. So there's always sort of going to be a, a coming and going. Um, I don't think IE's been that bad the last year or two. So I know we're going to sort of segue and, and talk about why that is. Um, and it's I, I get that they decided to go towards a new platform um, with Edge. And, you know, that again, you know, Edge, I just mentioned some of those other guys out there. Part of the problem with that is you go to a new platform is, okay, do you have to start over from scratch when it comes to um, securing and, and, and actually having a firm grasp on, on the platform that you're using and what its uh, capabilities and vulnerabilities are? So that'll be interesting to see, I think. 
Yeah, and you hit on some interesting aspects there too, especially the often it can be that surprise that on iOS is in fact is just WebKit underneath, which mm -hmm. is done for a very specific you know security reasoning because browsers can be so um, rife with critical updates. You know, the <laughs> browsers are essentially the modern Flash. You know, if you look back to the amount of call them zero days or just critical updates that all of them, Safari, Edge, as well as Chrome, have had to uh, release over the year, uh, over even just 2020. Too. Obviously, not quite as many as Flash, but um, a lot of what Chrome pioneered and what Safari was doing and what Edge is doing as well is changing the architecture uh, of the browser. So now we have process separation that is both an enhance of privacy uh, in terms of what if scenarios, if a process is compromised can what what mm -hmm. more information can be gathered from it as well as just the the sandboxing and isolation so one of the things i'm going to kind of mention here is to as, as you were helping me out with the segue is that oftentimes many of these browser-based exploits a lot of phishing exercises don't need vulnerabilities to get to root they just need vulnerabilities to get into the browser because the browser if you can break same origin policy through one mechanism or another through obviously exploits um, that you can get Cookies, you can get authentication tokens, you can get a lot of data. And this is where bug bounties come in. And I wanted to give a positive highlight to Internet Explorer and Microsoft in this case for being one of the pioneers of uh, setting up bug bounty programs. And back mm -hmm. in 2013, uh, actually this this month, in, in June 26 in 2013, in fact, uh, Katie Masuris, who hopefully the name is familiar to many of, many of you out there, one of the pioneers of vulnerability disclosure, bug bounty programs, um, but she wrote up the uh, and her team the bug bounty program that they were uh, operating for about a month for IE11. And the write-up looks almost identical to one you would see today, both in payouts, $500 to $11,000, as well as the broad categories they're looking at, RCEs, design vulnerabilities, um, as well as uh, privacy implications associated with the bugs, and a sandbox escape. And so what's interesting is that a decade later, we still have bug bounties, we still have bugs because humans are writing software. But I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are, just looking back, how you've obviously, you know, how you've seen the industry move, even if if you've done some bug bounty programs yourself, John, $500 to $11,000 after 10 years, RCEs, sandbox escapes, you know, is anything really changing meaningfully here? And I'm not necessarily saying lack of change might be the fault of bug bounties, but maybe bug bounties aren't just the only tool we should have or we should be figuring out what's the good way to use bug bounties here. Yeah. It's it's funny as I think through, and it'd be interesting, this is one of those things, it's, it's I'd love, I've said before, I'd love to start doing a little more data crunching for the show. Um, in, in my mind, you know, and we always joke about IE6, but I think once they hit, uh, was it eight? Things became a lot more um, mm -hmm. not just stable, but it, it seems like that's when they started taking security a little more seriously. I'm not sure the timeline on that. Um, I'll try to pull it up in a second when that came out. Maybe it is right around when Katie was doing that. But so I think a long time ago in the Galaxy Far Far Away, they started taking security a little more seriously in IE, um, and I think that sort of helped. A, a lot of the sort of the obvious things got sort of tamped down. So where I'm going with that is I think over the last few years. Well, we've seen issues with these browsers, and well, excuse me, with this browser, um, and I, I think there has been a few sort of, you know, pretty sticky issues. There's been a lot less. So, do we chalk that up purely to bug bounty, or you know, what's the sort of the, the actual cause? Or that could be an interesting paper for Microsoft, Microsoft to, to write. I think, um, sort of looking back on the security of um, mm -hmm. of this, you know, all our all our listeners over at Microsoft. I know there's so many. <laughs> Um, it'd be interesting to have someone sort of do that paper. That'd be a good talk for, for some conference. Um, but I think the way you're thinking about it, Mike, is that, that that sort of makes sense. It's like, okay, is what was it, like I said, was it purely bug bounty or is there, you know, isn't the other aspects of AppSec? Um, the libraries which they're using have probably matured massively, right? Especially, I imagine if you're doing a clean sheet, right, a clean sheet rewrite for Edge, using a new engine underneath the hood, which has been getting a tons of eyes on it from some very big names in the industries. 
for the last at least five years, um, that that should at least get you going on a pretty good start. Hopefully, there's been so many learnings from whoever's actually there from before. I know you know everyone moves and moves around, but there's got to be some number of folks who have been <laughs> working on browsers for the last ten years. Wow, you guys! Um, imagine that being your job. I'm sure it's exciting to somebody, not to me. Um, but if you've <laughs> You've been working on browsers all this time. You've probably learned a few things, right? And how you actually, how do you go about security? What areas do you need to focus on? Um, you know, how do you do encoding or um, uh, um, all those sort of aspects of where we usually see the the, the security vulnerabilities? Um, and what I'm sort of walking through is, is I think it's not just AppSec itself is what I'm trying to say here, but like the libraries which you select, how you write the code, to let the code, the languages you're writing in, right? How much of this, if any, is written in Rust? Um, the components of your underlying operating system, which you are leaning upon to help be secure. Um, so I would like to think that many, many aspects of this have gotten better. Uh, and including, isn't Microsoft actually trying to move away from patch to say, if I remember right, I think they're trying to, you know, be able to release patches, um, um, out of band a little more efficiently. So hopefully that'll sort of affect this as well. So I think it's sort of a, an overall push, which will hopefully have a, uh, a continuing to be a, a decent product. Yeah, and there is, it's interesting, you, too, you mentioned the, the operating system uh, aspect of this, too, because, mm. yes, I strongly agree that we've seen, in, in my mind, I think it's the architecture improvements, the ideas that we will try to still make a performant browser, and we have, you know, I'm, I'm using the, not the royal we, because that would be me, I'm using the general industry we, um, of looking at um, just, just uh, the, the performance metrics for rendering a page, first first paint of a page, if you will, and saying, is, you know, separating into multiple processes going to be uh, still user-friendly in addition to gaining the security aspects of that. And we've seen some back and forth with that. Chrome has definitely pioneered a lot of the performance metrics around that, and they're paying cl very close attention to what that happens. But even, I want to say, if my memory is serving correctly, last year or within the last year, Safari has come out and said, we're making some changes, but the end user uh, impacts, the visible impacts to the user, uh, aren't really regressions. There are regressions against some of the benchmarks. That's the term I'm looking for. Um, but those benchmarks can all, sometimes be artificial, or they're benchmarks that don't reflect the, the human experience of interacting with it. Um, so that's one aspect. And IE also, um, and Edge has been looking at some of those aspects too with its super duper secure mode. And oh. uh, but as you start, as I started this train of thought on talking about the operating system, because we had an article within the last month that Firefox was able to Firefox 100. Uh, finally able to take advantage of some syscall changes on the Microsoft platform. So this is a way that Microsoft is also changing its syscalls, changing some of its underlying operating system that's better accommodating for the security of browsers itself. So it, it is definitely interesting that, you know, I, I don't think anyone is making the premise that bug bounties are alone are making us secure, let alone mm -hmm. necessarily bug bounties are the high signal for this. It seems more of that really interesting, what's just what's that behind the scene work? What is you know the the folks working on these browsers for the last decades that you know those of you out there that do find this interesting, what are the changes that have been meaningful to you in terms of being able to make sea changes in for for security improvements so that we have fewer uh, or less impactful uh, vulnerabilities over time? Yeah, um, and I think that's you know it's. One of the things, if we really sort of go back in time, that had people gnashing the teeth was um, IE being such a uh, connected part of, of Windows, right? And that was sort of considered a, um, uh, oh, come on, words, uh, a monopoly, but also sort of uh, anti-competitive is the word I'm looking for. Um, but at the same time, and you know, Steve Jobs talked about this back how many times in the day, that that having that ability to, well, he was talking about software and hardware, but in this modern day, the ability for the components on top of that OS to have, um, you know, strong connections, hopefully, you know, it's 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 a small little company of what, 50,000 people, but uh, hopefully, um, at least in here locally, uh, that group, there's going to be someone who knows someone in the other teams to be able to go and actually have those conversations and get those pieces that help each other out. Um, that that 
definitely has it's a lot easier to do that if you're if you're working for the same company if you're getting paid by the you know same name on the paycheck versus if it's someone over at Google or somewhere else versus not versus but them trying to work with Microsoft uh, or any other company right it, it, it makes it easier it's that that's sort of one point um, I'm going to back up a bit because I'm going through this the uh, uh, announcement of the um, uh, 25th um, I can't call it an anniversary but the, the sun setting. And let's see, where was the phrase I was looking for in here? It's it's a fun, it's an interesting read uh, for folks to sort of check out this blog post. Um, there's all sorts of great phrases like Windows 10 China Government Edition. Um, <laughs> didn't know that was a thing. Apparently it is. Uh, also, the other one that caught my eye in here, what I was trying to, I was back reading to figure out. Um, so if you are uh, a professional developer, you've got products which which use these, these tools, um, and you're trying to move over to Edge and you're having issues, they've got an email address, um, achelp at microsoft.com. And when I saw that, um, it's, uh, let's see, the sentence is, you can get no-cost remediation assistance for those issues from our AppAssure compatibility experts. Um, I'd love to see how many emails are going to that address because uh, that's going to test out the, the strength of their mail server, right? That, that's going to be, at least for the, the f next few months, um, that's going to be a, a lot of people try to figure out how does this stuff work. And it's, you know, again, good that they're offering it. But so going back to what you're saying, back on the bug bounty thing, um, the thought that entered my mind when you're sort of talking about there, Mike, is the it, – it's, it's great that we've got uh, large budgets for bug bounties from some of these organizations. Mm -hmm. In my mind, what I want out of a bug bounty – is if I find something and I submit it to a company, you know, recognition is nice, but they, they take it with um, sincerity. They try to fix it. And, you know, if, if I'm helping them secure their product, they recognize that and and I get something in return, right? It, it, it's, at the end of the day, it's a way of saying thank you. It's I know people are, are able to make, um, you know, they're able to survive and make salaries, or not salaries, but they're able to, you know, make their livelihood through that. Mm-hmm. But I think in general, like if I'm if I'm tittering along and, and you know usually for me I very seldom do actual security research. If I'm if I'm playing with something and I'm like, hey, that doesn't look right, then I will start, and I'm bored or I, I want to you know to play. I'll I'll dig in and see what I can find. And if I find something at that point and I open um, a ticket, it's nice to get. It's nice in my mind, especially with a large vendor like this, for them to say not just oh cool we'll get to that. Or, you know, we'll fix that, thanks, but hey, throw me a few bucks or, a, you know, a cup of coffee or something. I think that's the way I think of a bug bounty. Um, they have, that's really changed over the last, particularly five years, I think, into something where, you know, we've talked about this how many times in the year? I'm sure someone calls this uh, bug bounty security weekly. But, <laughs> so you know, the, the, the aspect of, because I know I do, um, the... the aspect of some of these budgets are getting so big and some of the payouts are so big that... That that's that's the thing of interest, and we, we ask why. But I think, you know, it's it, well. There, there's reasons again. We've talked about this, but just over really quickly, the you know, vendor A or organization A wants to be able to make sure they still get eyes. So if if organization B starts, you know, trying to attract those eyes by by waving more around more of that uh, fancy cash, then org A has to try and man up and uh, bad phrase uh, cash up, and um, you know, sort of somehow come up to some sort of um, parity. So I think that's an interest. There's the aspect of attracting the public researchers to focus on your product and try to find vulnerabilities, which you're not finding yourself because you're either you can't hire those people or you can't hire enough of them or you know pick your reason. But I, at least I personally am interested not so much from that, but the hey, I'm helping you out. You know, throw me a bone. Um, I don't know. Is that, does that ring t um, uh, uh, as logical or sensical to you in any way, or what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, I, I wanted to make the initial joke, and you know, if you submit something, you know, you find something a bit off, a bit strange that you're poking at on a on a web app or some something, and you know, you you submit it to a company, and you know, you're happy for them to throw some money or throw some coffee back. That's a much different attitude than it used to be. Um, uh, you know, what 10, 20 years ago, especially when uh, the, the the kind response back came from the legal department, and yeah. Um, so yeah, so so that alone has been a good 
uh, shift. I was going to use sea change again. I'm not trying trying mm-hmm. to avoid too many cliches. Um, but that, that's been a shift that has been good from bug bounties. Although, um, anecdotally, we've still seen the occasional uh, a poor response from companies who don't understand the, uh-huh. the properties of coordinated disclosure or just yeah. vulnerability disclosure in, in general. So still an area to to improve there. I, I think some of the what 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 I would draw more out of what you were saying too, or is why why I see the good aspects or the useful aspects of a bounty program is the the idea that the th- those high payouts are a proxy indicator for saying that an architecture is improving or there is mm. you know, or there are stronger mitigations in place that we think, for example, a Google or an Apple says, we think that our Apple Messenger is pretty strong now. Find a flaw in that, we'll have we'll we'll send you a great bounty. Google as well, talking about Chrome or Chrome OS or Android, find a critical RCE in there that is, you know, called the the, the zero click, the, to, to use some of the modern fun names. Um, you'll get, you know, on the order of a hundred thousand dollars. What's interesting there is they're they're focusing on assumptions saying that we think we've killed off an entire attack class prove us mm-hmm. wrong and that kind of friendly antagonism i, I think is really good what yeah. where i see a bug bounty that can go in the wrong direction is more of the idea of here's a bug here's another example of a bug here's another cross-site scripting for uh for pick your pick any type of web application or maybe in a browser here's something that is a small uh, UI redress attack, where here is like, uh, this isn't browsers again, I'm going back to, but here's a, a, a log, log out CSRF type of attack. These are things that might be bugs because they should be fixed. They they speak to more quality, but they're not getting into fundamental things that lead to fundamental architecture changes or areas that are pointing to getting rid of an attack class. So, um, I guess I'm losing a little bit of steam on necessarily the the connection for bug bounty to doing that work because I think it's more of bug bounty is a let's call it a lagging indicator perhaps that mm. uh, whether it's a browser or some other piece of software is actually maturing in a good security manner. So th- that's how I like to mentally think of bug bounties and, and running them. That's interesting. Um, the whole aspect of it being a, a lagging indicator. Oh. Um... I guess that's true, but that that sounds like a good thought experiment. I'd want to run the, run that around in my head for a little bit, um, and and sort of back on the the you know the uh, we'll say payouts or the 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 level of interest or focus from an organization. You know, just for for folks listening in, um, you know, I've gone through MSRC a few times, the Microsoft uh, Security mm-hmm. Research Center when I submit something, um, and what. You know, it's, it's for for those who haven't done it. As you go through and specify the product, the version, the OS, and all these type of things, this is a very rich, well done system, right? This it's there are things at Microsoft I like, um, but as you as you come through this, you're getting gated down into both the person who is going to be interacting with you, who has um, uh, a level of expertise on the product which you are attempting to report a an issue on. Um, but you're also being triaged through what they think either priority on this is. So, like, I'm guessing that um, I did something recently on uh, um, uh, uh, Outlook Online, which they decided was not an issue. But um, mm-hmm. that's being the team that's that's focusing on that versus the team that's focusing on, I don't know, one of the six, let's talk about Yammer. I was going to say one of the six chat platforms, but I just thought of Yammer and that's still there. Um, so Yammer is probably getting a little less um, people actually responding to those tickets versus um, Outlook.com or something a little more public and, and heavily used. Um, but there, there's all sorts of ways that these things get sort of triaged down through that. And then also the other side of that is if you find a O'Day in Yammer versus if you find an O'Day in, um, you know, I'm guessing right now Edge, they would probably care about that a little more. So the payouts are going to be different around that. And it's just sort of um, providing a um, uh, what that experience is like from someone submitting something on the other side is really what I'm just trying to talk about and give our listeners an idea. But yeah, um, I don't know. I, we, we've sort of killed this one, I think. What do you think? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I think it's as as we use Edge in coming days and weeks, it'll you know just sort of keep in the back of your mind 
all the work that's been done by a, a lot of people, both researchers and public, um, all the work that's been done, even to put like a single blog post together of, you know, here's all the videos on, on how to move. Here's the differences here. You know, there's a ton of work goes into this stuff. Um, and we, we make jokes sometimes about where's all the money go. Um, but there's, and, and I'm not even talking about the PR marketing people, uh, but it, it's, you know, it, as you use these things, think about, you know, how much work has people gone into to try and secure them and try to make them work right. Uh, and then also, you know, what, what the security hat on when you see something that doesn't look right, go, Hey, is, is that the way that's supposed to be? Or maybe I can go and poke around and, and find something in it. So good to think about. No, good. And I'll, as I'll throw another uh, thing for you to think about too. I mentioned lagging indicator. Here, here's a thought of that a possible argument for bug bounties being a leading indicator that uh, especially if you haven't, if you start off with your AppSec program saying, let's have a bug bounty program. Every single thing that comes in is going to be low hanging fruit is going to be those items that you probably should have figured out already from a, a, a simple security tool, a simple configuration check, and uh, you're going to get slammed by a whole bunch of, uh, of issues. So that's interesting, too. Um, but I think, yes, we've we, we've just about beaten to uh, to a pulp this particular topic. Uh, John, you can install Edge on Mac OS. So even if you didn't, uh, you know, IE 11, you couldn't throw that onto um, Mac OS quite so easily. Uh, you can with Edge. So that's also just kind of a different shift in uh, the just the the organization organizational the company relationships between microsoft apple and so on um but i don't have a good uh security insight for that comment there but i think yeah. maybe yeah, just, <laughs> that's called filling time but, i think um, i think i might have powershell on my mac just or on one of them i don't know which one it's on i've I played with powershell on on that but yeah i don't have edge on here yeah no sorry that i'm uh i'm not that uh um interested i've got enough browsers on my machines i don't need another one <laughs> That's probably very true. You know what we don't need? Another uh, section of trying to get more, uh, squeeze more information out of the, out of the, the death of IE11. So le let's leave it right there. It's been 25 plus years. Uh, thank you for all you've done for us, both on the Buck Bounty researchers, as well as people just trying to uh, look at websites. And uh, one, one small asterisk there, you did mention too, John, that, um, you know, browsers were, is especially IE, we're trying to be more integrated with into the operating system. And with the browsers come advertisements. And we saw very briefly an experiment with advertisements into uh, the, uh, the what the Finder application. Uh, so let's make sure that those advertisements stay out of there, but um, <laughs> just yeah. in general on everything else. But with that, let's uh, go ahead, catch our breath, take a quick break, and return with some news of the week. 